And welcome to the third of our series of excellent lectures given by our Excelsius clinician covering many major and common medical conditions we all face in our everyday practice. Today, we are very fortunate to have the chief of our healthier eye specialist, Dr. Di Zhao, to give us a talk on a very common problem we face among the elderly, which is blurry vision. Dr. Di Zhao is a uh, adjunct faculty at the New York Eye and Ear Infirmary, which is a uh, so, uh, affiliate uh, with Mount Sinai. She did her medical school at NYU School of Medicine. And after that, she did her residency at the Kresge Eye Institute at Wayne State University. And she also did a fellowship in glaucoma at Mount Sinai, again, New York Eye and Ear Infirmary. So it's really my pleasure to introduce Dr. Zhao. Uh, thank you, Dr. Poon. Uh, can you hear me? I just want to confirm everyone can hear yeah, me okay. Hear okay, you. fantastic. So thank you, Dr. Poon, for setting this up. And I'm delighted to be here today to talk to you about uh, blurry vision in the elderly population. All right, so we'll just get started. Give me one minute. I'm going to set up the share screen. Okay, good. Okay, let me just make sure. Okay, how do I get this? Okay, so uh, blurry vision, you know, that, that's kind of like a very big topic. I can probably spend like months and years talking about blurry vision in the elderly population, but I'm going to try to keep it short and sweet on what you need to know as primary care providers. Uh, so this is our clinic, one of our clinics. Uh, so I just want to begin with saying I want to thank Excelsior for giving me this opportunity to start an ophthalmology division. Uh, it's been a pleasure, and we, um, I feel like we've been doing the community, we've been serving the community, and we hope to continue to do good work. So uh, as far as vision loss goes, this is uh, data from the NEI. Um, it looks at vision loss uh, as in terms of um, like an economic cost burden. And if you look at the graph over here, um, this is uh, broken down by age group. And this, is, this shows the co total cost of vision loss or blindness burden in terms of age. So the, this, this very small number, $9.4 billion, is the uh, economic cost per se of, of vision loss. So 9.4 in uh, patients under uh, eight, zero to 18. So basically children, pediatrics. So not a lot, which is expected. Uh, if you look here in uh, age 19 to 64, so adults, uh, this, this uh, graph goes from 9.4 to $52 billion. So, okay, so now this number is coming up. And then if you look at 65 plus, okay, wow, even more. So this is on an annual basis, $72 billion lost. Um, so this is kind of the population that's our bread and butter here at Excelsior. So we're going to talk more about uh, what happens to the this age group. So, you know, some of it's common sense, uh, quality of life and vision loss. Of course, you know, vision loss doesn't per se directly lead to mortality uh, in the same way as, let's say, having a heart attack. But uh, there's been many, many studies that show that the quality of life is significantly reduced when patients report vision loss. So let's talk about it a little bit more. So let's say you have a 75 year old lady. Um, she doesn't see well for what you know, whatever reason. Um, that's going to affect how her walking gait. So she may walk through a clinic slower. She may feel less comfortable, you know, walking down the steps, even stepping on a street curb. She, you know, if she's not sure where to step, that could lead to problems. And I've had patients who come to me having fallen, just try to step down a street curb. Um, obviously, this leads to greater dependence on others for activities of daily li living. Uh, so that means, you know, there may be greater dependence on their children, 
we um in the in this community you know everybody has like a homemade that may mean that you know instead of having requiring 10 hours of homemade assistance they may need 30 hours of homemade assistance so that's one facet of uh, vision loss and quality of life um the framingham eye stud study is actually a very uh, seminal paper and it looked at patients with uh visual acuity worse than 2100 what that so what that really means 2100 is um what the patient sees at 20, 20 feet is the same as what somebody, a normal person would see at 100 feet. Uh, at that point, you're more or less legally blind. Legally blind is 2200. So you're basically one step on the chart from uh, legally blind. So in patients with visual acuity worse than 2100, um, they were more than twice as likely to have a hip fracture than patients who had a relatively normal visual acuity. Um, and then they, uh, other separate studies have shown that, you know, when they looked at patients admitted for hip fractures in the hospital, um, 46%, so basically half of the patients had some kind of visual impairment, whether that's cataracts or macular degeneration or glaucoma. So again, as Excelsior is going to, um, you know, transitioning to the, this value-based global risk model, um, you know, if our, one of our patients um, have a hip fracture and needs to be admitted because of a vision loss, that's going to be, um, you know, money that Excelsior will have to pay. So we have to be cognizant of these, uh, these challenges. So um, other things to be concerned about when you do have vision losses, uh, faster progression of cognitive uh, ability in patients with uh, vision impairment. So if somebody already has some Alzheimer's, uh, you you add that on top of you add vision loss on top of that chances are their their cognitive abilities are going to decline even faster and that kind of makes sense right because the senses you know vision is one of the senses you know smell is another sense um, so all these things you know as you de as you degrade some of these um stimuli i would say it makes sense that the cognition goes down faster uh, and last and but not least, uh, there has been st a study showing that there's association between vision impairment and increased risk of mortality. And I think some of that has to do with, you know, if you have vision impairments that are untreated, that may be reflective of the overall health that you're in. So I think that's part of the reason on top of just having poor vision. So what are the common causes of blurry vision you might see in your clinic? And um, so I'm just going to kind of point out like the most common ones and things that your patients may ask you about. So number one on this list is refractive error and presbyopia. Th that really just means they, um, you know, presbyopia just means after the age of 50, your ability to read things close up diminishes with time. That's just due to uh, aging changes of your own lens, um, all normal, and everyone goes through this. Some people go through it faster than others. Uh, so refractive error, that's just the number, this is the number one cause of uh, blurry vision. And thankfully, this is probably the most easy um, thing to treat. Uh, dry eyes is probably number two. Um, cataracts is certainly up there. Everybody after the age of 55 has cataracts, no matter who you are. Uh, diabetic retinopathy is a concern as we have a high percentage of diabetic patients. And glaucoma, I would say, kind of rounds out like the top five. So let's go over what exactly is refractive error. So if you look here on the left-hand side, this is a normal eyeball, meaning this person does not wear glasses. So when light comes through the front of the eye, which is called the cornea, uh, the light gets kind of reflected back right at where it needs to be, right onto the retina. The light rays focus onto one single point, the retina. That's how we see well. So this is a normal eye, doesn't need any glasses. Uh, then you go to somebody who's nearsighted or myopia, we call it. Um, what happens is when the light goes through the eye, uh, for whatever reason, whether it's the lens or the, the shape of the cornea, um, it causes the light rays to uh, focus at a point before it hits the retina. So that's why you need to wear glasses to, to, to have you see better. And this is the most common refractive error, um, myopia. Um, hyperopia, which is farsighted, it means uh, when you're younger, everything was fine. You didn't wear glasses. But, you know, in your early 40s, you've noticed that, like, you cannot see well for reading, but the distance is still relatively okay. This just means the eye is a little bit weaker. The cornea is a little flatter. Maybe the lens is not as strong as somebody else's lens. So when the light gets reflected, um, what, by the time it becomes one focus point, it's already behind the retina. Hence, that's why it's blurry. Um, astigmatism uh, can 
coexist with myopia and hyperopia basically means that, as you can see here when light hits the eye the cornea there's scattering of the light um so when like i i tell patients it's like when you're at night driving and you look at the the car lights the the light is not a circle it's like a scatters from its original point so that's that's essentially what astigmatism is so uh treatment in most cases just means giving you know prescribing glasses. And our we're thankful that um, most of our Medicaid patients have uh, vision coverage, so they should be able to get free glasses uh, at the shop, at the optical store with my prescription. Um, in some cases, when, you know, when the, the patient's prescription is really too high, you know, pathologic myopia, where there's like irregular corneas, whether that's from a scar or an injury, then they need to wear contact, medically necessary contacts, and, um, and we can help with that as well. So let's talk about our, mo our second most common cause of blurry vision. Um, so that would be dry eyes. Uh, what, what that really means is, um, you know, this is kind of a multifactorial disease. Um, there's, for most patients, not one singular reason why we have dry eyes. Generally, it's, you know, a culmination of age, as unfortunately, as we age, our ability to create tears diminishes with time. So that's one portion. Uh, another portion is inflammatory modulators that may be out of whack for certain people due to whether it's autoimmune diseases or hormonal changes. Um, and a lot of it's also coexisting, um, uh, coexisting ocular disease that may exacerbate things. So, you know, you, pe pe people think, oh, it's just dry eyes, no big deal, right? Just like dry skin. Why, why does this even matter? So, you know, the cornea is one of, which is the front part of the eye, that's like the clear part. So when you look at somebody's eyes, it's kind of, you know, it, it's not hazy, it's it's clear. So that's the what the cornea is. It's, a, uh, it's one of the most sensitive organs in the human body. It has one of the densest nerve innovations in the body. So that's why one when people do have dry eyes, they're very symptomatic. It, it, there was actually a paper that where patients actually rated their dry eyes as being comparable to having angina. So it, I was really shocked by that, but that's how, that's how symptomatic some of these people are. And it makes sense because there's a lot of nerves on the cornea and there's evolutionary advantages to having a very sensitive cornea because, you know, you want to be able to, it, the cornea regulates the blink reflex. You know, we blink like 15, times every minute. So, and that's helpful in terms of lubricating the eyes and protecting dust and stuff from getting in there. And if somebody tries to poke you an eye, your first thing is to move back and blink your eyes. So that's why the cornea is very sensitive. So we talked about the balance of, you know, of, you know, dry eyes, you know, it's caused when, you know, TNF alpha and certain immunomodulators are upregulated. Uh, we're not going to get into this too much because uh, this, this talk itself could could be days. Um, and like I said, there's significant economic and quality of life impact because, you know, the patients come to you, um, they're going to say that, you know, their eyes don't feel comfortable. They feel like there's something in their eye and just being tired. And then, you know, once we start treatment on these things, um, you know, the, you know, eye drops get involved, expensive eye drops get involved. And again, it's, you know, we, we have to look at the economic impacts of these things. Uh, so dry eyes in itself is generally not dangerous. It's very common, especially during the, you know, post pandemic world where everybody's on their cell phone, you know, in increased screen time does lead, does exacerbate dry eye symptoms. Um, a caveat to dry eyes, I will say is this, there's many ocular diseases that could actually masquerade as dry eyes. So, you know, uh, I just list a few examples. Um, I, I herpetic disease, uh, VZV, scleritis, uveitis, these are very serious vision threatening disease, eye diseases. A lot of times some people may have one of these diseases, but they can present to you very similarly to dry eyes. So my perspective on this is from a primary care perspective, um, if you see, if you notice one of these warning signs, I, I would just, you know, I think an ophthalmology referral is recommended. I wouldn't start them on any topical antibiotics or, or any topical steroids because depending on what the disease is, the treatment can really vary. So we don't want to kind of, um, we just want to send them to ophthalmology to just let, let, me, let us deal with it. So I take, so I bring up this picture over here of somebody's eyeball. 
Uh, you see that the white part of the eye, you know, there's some blood vessels there. It looks very red. It's injected. So if you are just glancing at this quickly in clinic um, and somebody's talking, telling you, the patient saying, oh, my eyes don't feel great. You might think that this is just dry eyes. By the way, this is scleritis, which is a uh, vision threatening disease. So that's what I'm saying. Like sometimes things don't always uh, look appearances can be deceiving. And sometimes when I look at the patient for the first time, I have to kind of follow them a few times before I can decide like for sure, hey, is this scleritis? Is this something else? So um, ophthalmology referral is recommended if it's like unilateral or asymmetric eye symptoms. You know, I call them the warning signs. Like if there's pain, redness, tearing, blurry vision, uh, yeah, you should the patient should definitely see us. You know, if it's been going on for like 10 years versus like five days, right? Like if it's been going on for 10 years, there's, pro there's really no urgency to that. But if it's been, you know, it's very acute symptoms, that duration, then I would say definitely send to ophthalmology. Um, as far as the treatment goes for dry eyes, um, you know, the, the backbone of all dry eye therapy is artificial tears or lubricating drops. Um, there's different types of artificial tears, and depending on the patient's insurance, certain ones get covered and certain ones do not. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about the Medicaid patients that we have and also the Medicare, um, Medicaid dual eligible patients. Uh, artificial tears are, not, are generally over the counter for all commercial patients. So, um, you know, the first thing is to start artificial tears. Obviously, if artificial tears do not relieve symptoms uh, completely. There's ointments that we can do at night. There's a procedure called puncto occlusion via like a silicone plug or a collagen-like plug that can be done. Um, some patients may have some inflammation of the lash line, which is called blepharitis. So we would, we would treat that as well, just to see if that can help with some of the dry eye symptoms. Because again, dry eyes is a multifactorial disease. Um, I've noticed that a lot of patients are given restasis by their PCPs. Um, generally speaking, uh, restasis is immunomodulator. It, um, it essentially inhibits T cell uh, lymphocyte, uh, I'm sorry, T cell, yeah, lymphocyte activity. Um, so it, basically reduces inflammation. Um, generally, restasis is reserved as like more of a third line therapy. And it really, it, its efficacy is highly questionable. And it's really more for patients with autoimmune diseases and dry eyes. So just something that I, I mentioned. So our third uh, cause of uh, blurry vision is cataracts. So like I said, everybody over the age of 55 has cataracts. In the beginning, it's not visually significant, or let's say when you're, they're in their 60s, what they'll tell me generally is like, when I'm driving at night, I'm noticing things aren't as clear. There's more like glare and halo around the car lights. But during the daytime, you know, I really have no problem. So yes, that's just cataracts slowly changing over time. The average age of cataract surgery in this country is approximately 72 years old, but you know, everybody's different. So, you know, I operate, I've operated on as young as a 36 year old and as old as a 90 year old. So you know, everybody's just different and each person's situation um, will dictate when uh, it's appropriate for cataract surgery. Um, we, we can only operate on cataracts if it's visually significant that impacts activities of daily living. So the patient needs to be able to verbalize, you know, I have trouble seeing when reading or when reading my medicine bottle. Um, there's uh, insurance requirements as to what the visual acuity needs to be before they approve surgery. Um, so what I tell patients is we're all living longer. So chances are almost everybody's going to need cataract surgery at some point in life. And for most patients, this is a routine surgery. It's same-day surgery with minimal downtime and activity restrictions. It, it takes about 15 minutes to do the surgery itself. And then, you know, they go to the PACU unit, they rest for about five, 10 minutes, and then they go home and I see them the next day. So, you know, it's, it's about as routine as it can get as far as surgery is concerned. And I just want to put in a plug. There's no indication to stop any anticoagulation for routine cataract surgery. Um, there's, you know, generally speaking, cataract surgery is bloodless or minimally, uh, like very minimal uh, blood loss. So you do not need to stop their eloquence or their aspirin. Of course, some people need to have uh, other types of incisional surgery. So the most common ones you'll see uh, 
from me would be like pterygium surgery or glaucoma surgery. Those do bleed a lot. So we, we will generally write on the medical clearance, like, is it okay to stop their Coumadin for three, you know, for three days before or whatever they're taking. So anyways, so moving on. Uh, so the fourth uh, cause of blurry vision that affects elderly people is probably glaucoma. Um, it also happens to be the leading cause of irreversible blindness in this country. Um, so just if you look over here, so uh, there's three pictures. Uh, so if you look at this picture over here, uh, it looks like a relatively normal picture. Everything's clear. And then I have superimposed this with the visual field. OK, uh, the visual field basically just it's basically a test where the patient has to look at a bunch of blinking lights and click a button if they see these blinking lights. It's meant to assess their peripheral vision in a very methodical fashion. Um, so this is somebody with normal vision. And as you progress, you know, go from left to right. Uh, you see that the picture starts to blur a little bit, especially in the periphery. But, you know, if you look at early stage glaucoma, like the blurring, which is right here where the car, the red car is, it's very subtle. Um, and this happens slowly over years. So it's very possible somebody doesn't even notice. Uh, and most patients with early glaucoma do not notice that there's anything wrong. You cannot, quote unquote, feel glaucoma. If you feel, if your eyes feel tired or dry, that's because you have dry eyes. That's not because of the glaucoma. Glaucoma doesn't cause pain unless it's acute angle closure, and that's a completely different um, disease process. And if you look here, this is late stage glaucoma where, hmm, okay, so now I'm starting to see more fuzz around, fuzzy stuff around the periphery. So uh, we're in the business of preventing people coming to us in later stage glaucoma because uh, vision loss from glaucoma is irreversible at this time. So we want to find them in the early stages start the treatment so it doesn't lead to the later stages because in late stage glaucoma, you're gonna have to need to do more surgical intervention, which from a value-based standpoint, it would not be good economically. You're gonna need more homemade help. Uh, that's not good either. You're gonna need to, you need gonna need to start more eye drops and that's all very expensive things. So we wanna keep everybody in the early stage glaucoma possible. So like I said, it's a leading cause of irreversible blindness in the U.S. About over 3 million people were diagnosed. The actual number is much higher because it's asymptomatic in the early stages. A lot of people don't realize they have glaucoma. Um, risk factors, age is probably number one over the age of 50. Um, race is also a risk factor. African Americans uh, have a much higher rate of going blind from glaucoma than everyone else. And, all, and positive family history um, are risk factors. So again, because this is asymptomatic, it highlights the importance of screening for glaucoma and having regular eye exams for older patients, like age, you know, especially over like 65 and over. Of course, 32 year olds, generally speaking, there's no risk factors, don't need to be screened for glaucoma. All right, so now we're kind of in the home stretch. I wanna talk about uh, di uh, diabetic retinopathy. Um, so the guidelines are every diabetic patient must have an annual diabetic eye exam or retina exam. Um, so let's take a look at this picture. What is diabetic retinopathy? Okay, so this is a picture of a fundus. A fundus just means retina. Um, when you, if you look at the circle, this oh sorry, if you look at this yellow circle over here, that's the optic nerve. Everybody has a nerve that connects eye to the brain. This looks all pretty normal. These red stuff are blood vessels. The fatter blood vessels are veins. Uh, the smaller skinny guys are the arteries. So if you look here, hmm, okay. So there's this big patch of red stuff. That's bleeding. Um, based on this picture, this patient already has proliferative diabetic retinopathy. So that's almost like, uh, like that's already very, very severe and will require a lot of treatments, which again, more dollar signs. So this patient has neovascularization from abnormal blood vessels due to retinal ischemia. If you look here, this is the macula. This patient probably doesn't see well. All this like fibers, striations, this is a, there's already membrane changes because of the diabetes. And then you see all this white stuff that's exudates. Exudates yellow spots just means that the blood vessels are leaking because from diabetic disease. And this patient will need 
retina intervention. So I'm not a retina specialist. So at this point, I would have to send this patient to a outside doctor in the community to probably to do an injections, which become very cumbersome because they've had to be done on a monthly basis. And most patients do not like them long term. And they're going to need lasering. In fact, this patient's already had some lasering. So all things that nobody wants to do. But um, so we want to we're in the business of preventing people from looking like this. So uh, what is the incidence of diabetic retinopathy? So according to the multi-ethnic uh, study of arthrosclerosis, um, basically they, the researchers in this country uh, in six different communities ranging from Los Angeles to Philadelphia, they s- followed a group of patients over an eight year span and they took retina pictures eight years apart, two retina pictures eight years apart and compared them to see what was a, what was the incidence and also progress, you know, incidence of retinopathy. So after eight years, um, it, uh, 5.3% of Hispanics have diabetic retinopathy, followed by 1.8% in Black and Chinese Americans. And then the lowest group was uh, Caucasians. So the, thankfully, the incidence and also, you know, from my experience, my experience having seen a lot of exhaustion patients, uh, the incidence of retinopathy that needs treatment besides lowering your A1C is relatively low, but when they do need treatment, it ends up being a lot of different things that need to be done for them. So what are risk factors for retinopathy and disease progression? So the number one culprit is elevated A1C. We tell the patients the magic number is under seven. You must keep your sugar under seven. If you keep it under seven, chances are you will be okay. Um, Elevated LDL is also a risk factor. So from a PCP perspective, you know, even without like looking at my eye report, you can probably get a sense of who's going to have retinopathy. So what do I mean by that? I mean, if your patients are, if your patients are insulin dependent diabetics, chances are they're going to have some varying degrees of retinopathy. Um, I've noticed a lot of the insulin dependent uh, patients at Excelsior, um, a lot of them it doesn't don't seem to be very compliant with insulin use and their A1Cs or whatever. I look at the, our, you know, their lab reports, it's, it's always like eight, nine, 10, 11. It's, um, so insulin dependent use, uh, diabetics are definitely at high risk. Uh, if they already have chronic kidney disease, like I always look at the urine reports to see if they have like protein in the urine. If they do, uh, for sure, they're going to have some level of retinopathy. It may just be mild and nothing needs to be done for that. It's just my continuing monitoring. And also uh, the third risk factor from a PCP perspective is um, if they've been on oral medications for over five years and they're poorly controlled, that's a big risk factor as well for having retinopathy. So this concludes uh, the end of my talk. Uh, Thank you very much for your attention. And if anyone has any questions, happy to discuss more. Thank you very much, Dr. Zhao, for a really informative talk. I... uh... I have a few questions to ask you. Um, Thank you for clarifying the uh, need to hold anticoagulant. What about antiplatelet like aspirin and Plavix? Would that be a factor? For routine cataract surgery, do not hold anything. Um, Keep their aspirin, keep their Plavix, keep their Eloquist, just keep everything going. Um, The reason why is, Cataract surgery, truly, you know, obviously if something, if something complicated happens, you know, there, you can have bleeding, but, but bleeding is relatively minimal. Um, I've just, you know, from my experience, knock on wood, I haven't really had patients with bleeding issues because of they were on anticoagulation during cataract surgery. So, and, you know, it, it, elderly patients have a hard time with their medications. I, you know, we just recently had a lady who's 65, has atrial fibrillation, is not, you know, is still in AFib because I, um, I checked her pulse. And she was told to stop the Eloquist. But then like two, three weeks later, she still hadn't restarted the Eloquist. I mean, oh, no. I mean, her chat score I, I, is high. So, no, we, we don't want people having strokes. So, I, I, and most ophthalmologists are in agreement. Just keep all antiplatelets, anticoagulation for cataract surgery. If it's something else like like pterygium surgery, glaucoma surgery, retina surgery, where there is chance of bleeding, and they, and we want you to stop for sure on the medical clearance, we're going to make it really clear. 
Mm -hmm. Like, can we stop? You know, I always, we, we circle it now. We, we, we make it very obvious. Um, or even my office sometimes may call just to confirm. Uh, the question about cataract, uh, I'm sort of in the age that I might need it soon. <laughs> does that, does <laughs> that um, fix the need for wearing eyeglasses? Is that, uh, is that uh, such benefit? Uh, yes and no. So depending on, so what I tell patients, so patients are like, well, do I need to wear glasses after my cataract surgery? Um, that question is highly dependent on what your eye looks like. So what do I mean by that? Um, in most people, they're dependency on glasses after cataract surgery is significantly reduced, meaning uh, your distance vision should be relatively good. Uh, you're just going to need a small pair of reading glasses to read the newspaper, you know, or the cell phone. However, uh, you can pay for premium lenses that can address astigmatism and multifocal lenses that can help you with reading. So, you know, I have patients who I've done these, you know, premium surgeries on and they don't need any, they don't need glasses for anything, whether it's distance or reading or anything. But I would say, generally speaking, most people will need some glasses for reading. Or you can speak with a doctor and they can, because they, we, can, we can titrate your prescription post-cataract surgery. So let's say, like some people, they're like, I don't drive. I don't, you know, I spend most of my time on the computer or the cell phone. So I'm like, okay, so I'm going to put you at a, rate, at a prescription where you can see your cell phone and your computer very clearly. But then maybe you'll need glasses for driving. Or some, or you know, we're looking at stuff far away, and a lot of people like that. So it's 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 a very personal decision. Yeah. I I, uh, I see uh, as a cardiologist, I, I I rarely look into my patient's eye except for uh, diabetic and looking for retinopathy. Now mm -hmm. I do see a lot of patients with uh, a condition that you know well, uh, Arcus um, uh -huh. Pinella. Yeah. Um, and, and we, we believe that it has to do with cholesterol. And, uh, I'm just curious if, um, if that's, if there's something that you can do, or is there something that you can do to prevent? What should I tell my patient when I see that? So Arcus Nilius is just like it sounds, it's basically cholesterol deposits, um, it deposits in the cornea, um, and it happens with age. Uh, generally speaking, if it's if you see Arcus before the age of 50, uh, you'll send them to their PCPs to get their uh, cholesterol panel checked, because that could be a sign that, you know, the, the, you know their triglycerides are 1,000 or, so, or their HDL, their LDL is like 300. But generally, you know, we're talking about elderly patients. So by the time they come see me, they're already 65. And some people have heavier arcuses than others. It doesn't mean that their cholesterol level is abnormal. It, it, there's no correlation. It's just part of an, it, unfortunately, it's just part of aging. And because we have Asian people occur irises versus uh, Caucasians generally, the contrast when you have like a white ring around your on the peripheral of your, uh, the, on the peripheral limbus, uh, which is the periphery of the cornea versus somebody with lighter eyes, it just seems more obvious to patients. We have a question uh, from the audience. Uh, Anita Lin uh, would like to ask you if hypertensive patients need retinopathy screening or at least for uh -huh. uncontrolled hypertension. Uh, Uncontrolled, hold on, let me see. Is there like a number? Like give me a systolic range that you, you, you're, you're, you're thinking of. Hold on, let me look at the chat. Uh, maybe. Let, let, uh, let's say 160 to 170 systolic. Um, to be frankly honest, if let's say you have a patient, you check their blood pressure in the office, it's 160 over 100. And then there, there's no vision change. They don't complain of any vision changes. In my mind, there's really no need to send to me just for that. Uh, we get, I don't know why the insurance companies keep saying every hypertensive patient needs a retina exam every year. If that was the case, I mean, the, 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 I mean, the screening utility is literally none. Because even if I see hypertensive retinopathy, 
which uh, essentially just means the retina has bleeding and the, macu the, the macula, which is the center part of the retina, may have some swelling changes. The tr there's nothing for me to do except to tell the patient, like, you have uncontrolled hypertension. There's, I, can, I do not change the treatment course in any way. Diabetic retinopathy is different. I can change the, the treatment course uh, for that, and I can change the, the, the course of the disease. But I, I, you know, if they don't have vision changes, it's, it's, I, I, I don't need to see them. Uh, any other uh, burning question from the uh, audience? Yes, I guess not. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Zhao, for a very informative presentation. Um, I'd like to see everybody again next month, and the speaker will be myself. <laughs> okay, great. All right. Thank you, All Dr. Right. Poon, for hosting. Thank you. Thank you. All, All right. right. Good night, everyone. Good night.